Hello, this is Pastor Mark Heinrichs of Sutton Baptist Church in Sutton, Vermont, a Vermont country pastor. I'd like to welcome, welcome you today to this YouTube video sermon. And today's sermon is about Genesis chapter 1 from the Bible. And one of the things I am very aware of is that most Christians really have never read in any kind of detailed way the story of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And so we have a culture which rejects the faith statement that God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. We have a culture which rejects that but we have a church which attempts to affirm it but doesn't really know what the Bible says. So it's very, very important that we look carefully at Genesis chapter 1. And, and we find a number of very important things. First of all, that God's creation is good. And when God created the various aspects of creation, he saw that it was good. And then even further, he blessed it. So not only is God's creation good, but it's also blessed. And so there's a number of very, very key, important truths and, and uh, realities that are addressed in Genesis chapter 1. And even for those who don't, who are not Christian or are inquirers but not sure what they believe, it's important to know what it is the Bible actually says. And so I have some skills in this area, some study skills. Uh, I have a master's degree from an accredited seminary and have studied the book of Genesis in real depth and worked under professors that uh, really, really understand the Hebrew and the context, and the, that is the language and the context and many different factors which are important in this. And so anyways, what I'd like us to do, what I'd like you to do is to come and join me in this uh, deep study of Genesis chapter 1, the story of creation from the Bible. And we'll look at it, what the Bible actually says, and maybe even what it doesn't say, and thereby understand who God is as Creator God. And then maybe through that we'll understand ourselves a little bit better as well. And so I invite you to come along with me into the church, and uh, we will uh, look carefully at Genesis chapter 1, the story of creation. And so there's three words that kept coming back to me as I did my study on this, which took a, uh, quite a few hours to really carefully look at this. There are three words that kept coming back to me, and uh, they were this specific quote, Then he said... So we're given this picture of reality before time, before creation, and God sees all of the various parts, which I'll talk about. And then there comes that line, that verse, which says, then he said, that is, then God said. So as you see, as you listen to me preach on this very important passage in the Bible, uh, we'll look at that and what that really means in terms of the whole narrative. And so remember, the Bible can be looked at as a whole from all the way from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Revelations. All of the Old Testament, all of the New Testament, all brought together that there is a thread there. And, uh, and so let's look very, very carefully and deeply at what God says to us in the Bible about creation. Good morning. Today I'm going to preach from Genesis chapter 1. And as I've been telling the congregation here, if we don't understand the message 
of Genesis chapter 1, then we have a problem understanding the rest of the Bible. And so I'm going to read the first um, several important points of Genesis chapter 1, and then we'll look very carefully and very closely at that so that we can gain an understanding of the way that God created things. And here's the, here's the headline. God created things good, and then he blessed them. And what a, what a marvelous way to start our understanding of things. So I'm going to begin by reading uh, from Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. Evening came, and then morning, the first day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came, and then the morning of the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and he called the gathering of the water seas, and God saw that it was good. God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, fruit trees of the earth bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, seed bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then the morning, the third day. Then with uh, verse 14 and on, God creates the lights in the sky and uh, created uh, daylight and nighttime. God created the life in the seas and uh, each creature according to its kind. Then God produced living creatures on the land according to their kind, livestock and wildlife. And so God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl the earth. And verse 27 is very, very important. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. And so then it goes into chapter 2 and it said, So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. By the seventh day God completed his work in, that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for he rested on it from his work of creation. And here ends the reading of scripture. So, uh, one thing that I've noticed in years and years of ministry is, a, a, and I don't have the answer to this question, but here's a question. Do we understand what the Bible says? And I think it's proper to say that that is a lifelong effort that to understand what the scripture says, it takes some doing, and it takes some work, and, and there are the basics, of course, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We certainly have that, but then it does get uh, more interesting, shall we say. But with Genesis 1.1, suffice it to say that this is the big picture. This is the biggest picture that there is. This is a big picture, as big as big pictures get. How about that? God, in the beginning, God pre-exists creation. I can't emphasize that enough. 
I'll say that again in the beginning so we know that God pre-exists all of creation and that he was already there Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 God's already there hadn't been somewhere else wasn't all of a sudden created out of anything or nothing he was already there God is outside of time and history but that doesn't mean he's locked out of time and history in fact we know especially through Jesus that God is intimately involved in time space and matter but over and above it as well as deeply deeply involved so if we understand this from a biblical standpoint it answers a lot of questions about life so the name the word Genesis what does that mean it means origins generations beginnings begettings and it's talking about the dawn of antiquity as far back as time goes all the way to that first instant the origins this is the dawn of time in fact and so we have the title in the beginning god so verse one is kind of a title and it does in a sense stand a little bit separate from what comes after it in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it so verse 2 comes and and the bible begins to focus in on what was going on when god said okay here we go what was going on the earth was formless and void waste and void and that there there was uh, just a total confusion and chaos and 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 uh, that there was no matter no antimatter no trees no hills no sky God is before that, and so this out, this nothingness and this chaos and everything, God steps into it and he says, let there be light. Now, I've always kind of wondered, did, did he like yell it? Did he whisper? Did he just sort of say it conversationally? Like, um, oh, let there be light or was it let there be light like that I don't know I don't know but into the formlessness and the void God spoke his voice and the gospel of John says in the beginning was the word uh, the uh, gospel of John in a sense echoing Genesis and in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and, and it goes on to explain to us that in, in a spiritual sense, the words that God spoke at the very beginning were Christ speaking those words. And so into the, we are first presented with the darkness and the deep. The, uh, uh, the, it says that the, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, the earth was without form and void, and that there was a, a darkness and a chaos and a confusion present that God stepped into and spoke light and so the first couple of verses are, are kind of ominous and a little creepy too if you really understand the language that's being used here and uh, you know it's uh, it's like uh, just it's hard for us even to imagine that, that, that light had not been separated from darkness and sea had not been separated from dry land and, and all of those things and that it says that darkness covers the covered the face of the deep so that's that what they call the word there's here big theological word primordial chaos that that you you know if we were to step into it obviously we can't but if we were it would be beyond our ability to perceive at all darkness covered the face of the deep and it's not just a lack of light or insufficient light that it, it was a total absence of light light did not exist but interestingly, in the language that, that um, is being used here, there are intimations that in the chaos that there is something of malign evil intent in the confusion and in the chaos. And that's kind of an interesting thought right there. Darkness in the Bible represents evil and death. Uh, Jesus at the cross, Luke 23, 44, it was about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land and Jesus breathed his last. Psalm 91, 5, 
is a promise to us of protection. You shall not be afraid of the terror of darkness. So you can see in the Bible, darkness is considered, has a, has a weight of feeling to it, of ominous creepiness and like awfulness. And, uh, and so darkness was over the face of the deep, the watery abyss. And uh, for the, the, the Hebrew people who read or heard Genesis spoken to them, that is, that is what they heard, that's what they, that's what they uh, understood, and that that dark abode was a place of, uh, of chaos and destruction as personified by, this, uh, by a uh, goddess called Tiamat. Now, you also have to understand, stepping back a little bit about Genesis, the, the context that, that, uh, uh, that Moses, of course, is writing this stuff down from, from God, and uh, he, this is, these are one of the Genesis, one of the five books of Moses, the Torah, and uh, that you have to understand that the, the Hebrews at the time, they were moving uh, from Egypt through the desert into uh, into the promised land at the time that this was actually written down and recorded and that the, the, the mindset of the Hebrews at that time was that they were a monotheistic religion, that there was one God, not a higher God and an assembly of gods, but that there was just this one God and that this, this Genesis was a declaration of the oneness of God and that there was this one creator God and that he was over and above everything else. And so then the Spirit of God moves over it. Ruach Elohim, the breath of God, breathes over this chaos, this primordial chaos and darkness the breath of God, and so that's where we get those most important words, God said, then God said. Let there be light. And all of a sudden, pow, there was light. In the beginning, it's kind of an interesting, uh, so we have this picture, the chaos, then God said, the way in the Hebrew, uh, then God said is actually a derivation of the name of God. And it's, uh, there is a word play in involved in here, which is kind of interesting. But uh, that the very fact that God, then God said was a function of his very character and very nature. Let there be light. God was expressing his nature uh, as light and as enlightenment, the bringing light into a dark place. And so that tells us about the, the character of God and the glory of God right there to begin with. And so then, so God creates, let there be light, and then he begins to specialize and he separates the light from the darkness so he could tell that light was light and dark was dark. And then he also went and he named the light and it was day. And, and he also said that there was night. So he, de he declared and created and then he specialized and then he named it. So God creates this. And so this isn't an intervention as it's more of a creative pur purposeful action, just the character of God. Let there be light, and there was light. And then there's the conclusion, and God saw that it was good. So you can see all the way through the Genesis, there is this message, especially in the first chapter, God creates and it is good. God creates, it's good, and he blesses it. So there is a major theme here that there is the goodness of God's creation and we're still surrounded by it here today, praise God, that there is the goodness of God's creation. All around us, we're surrounded by it and that not only is it good, but that goodness is blessed by God. And I just think that's a very important point that we need to really embrace is that God's creation is good and it's full of blessing. And so the light is created. And it's not just any light, it's really good light. He says so. And, and I think that's another thing that we need to, uh, to remind ourselves. And so there comes a succession of let there be, let there be, let there be. Let there be the, the land, the separation of the waters. Let there be land which is separated from the seas. The separation of the waters could be understood. Uh, some people have talked about it as the waters above being like space 
and the waters below being the oceans. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that it's the separation of the salt water of the ocean from the fresh water of the lakes and the mountains and, and the land. And so there's God, let there be lights in the sky, let there be the sun, let there be the moon, all of these things. And even on uh, up to the sixth day, let the earth bring forth living creatures and creatures of the land, wild, wild animals, cattle. And then comes the high point of Genesis chapter one. Let us make humankind or mankind in our image according to our likeness. So there's an interesting thing there. Let us make in our that is a plural that's plural terminology god is speaking to himself yes god is one but we also know this is trinity sunday that god is three persons as well father son and holy spirit and there it is right in genesis chapter one let us make humankind in our image humankind we carry the image of god in us and around us now does that mean when i look in the mirror First thing in the morning, which is sometimes a horrible experience, but when I look in the, in the mirror that I see God looking back at me, no. What it means is that a portion of God's character and of his personality has been vested in us, has been given to us. And isn't that a remarkable, wonderful thought that a portion of God's character and his ethics and his nature and this beauty and, and, and some of his power is vested in us so that not only uh, can we live and breathe and, and enjoy the beauty of God's creation, but that we can uh, create living souls, families, have children. We can create husband and wife joining, creating living, breathing souls that also carry the image of the living God, which is just a marvelous, marvelous thought. And also, if you stop and think about it, the fact that God invests some of his character and some of his nature in us gives us those certain inalienable rights that we have in this country. The preamble to the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is because that we all carry the image of God in us and nobody can take it away from us. And so what a marvelous, marvelous thought that is. So uh, one of the messages of Genesis chapter one, and this is a re just a, uh, a huge point in the whole scan, uh, span of time, the whole scheme of things, is that when God made humankind, it was the high point of creation. Now, should we go out like, you know, being prideful and, you know, hey, I've got the image of God and, and that sort of thing. No, not at all, because of what comes later in the Bible, of course. We got Genesis chapter 3 and then everything else. But the very fact that we have invested in us a little bit of God's character and a little bit of God's nature makes us extremely important and therefore we are given, there's a word that people have trouble with today. Dominion. So what is dominion? God gives us dominion because we carry the nature of God in us. And dominion is a great capacity and it's a great responsibility. Part of our dominion is to create living souls, to have children that can grow up and go on and create living souls themselves. Dominion uh, is, is a uh, word that describes authority and rule. Let's just go ahead and say that. Now, has humankind used that badly? Oh boy, you know that's right. But nonetheless, God, when he invested his character and his nature in us, that capacity to rule well, and that capacity to rule according to the justice and the fairness and the ethical standards of God, that capacity is still in us, and that is a marvelous, marvelous thing. And that, in fact, God expects us to use that dominion that we have 
in a responsible, fair, and just manner because that's who he is and so we are to follow his example in that way. The dominion that he gives us assumes an underlying moral structure, justice, fairness, goodness, kindness, in every aspect of the exercise of that dominion. So when God says, let us make mankind, humankind, in our image, that we are to resemble God in an ethical and in a, uh, a moral kind of a way. And I guess it's not news to anybody here that maybe humanity has failed at this. But we'll talk about that later. So to, to conclude this, uh, Genesis chapter 1 morphs into Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all of their multitude. So that's an, what they call an inclusio. It's a bookmark there. Uh, a book end in, a, in effect. And on the seventh day God had finished and he rested and he blessed it and hallowed it. And then there's that final, final word. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So let's just recap this very quickly. God's creation is perfect. It's sufficient. It functions. It's moral. It contains broad categories of life, but it also has specialization and differentiation within categories. There are some boundaries that are distinct and inviolable, inviolable uh, like species and male and female differentiation. There is the moral and ethical character of God which is reflected in his creation. So, what could go wrong? Stay tuned to my next sermon. Amen?